All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a little LEC rundown, uh, just to share my thoughts about what I think about uh, what's going on in the LEC. Uh, we have finished week two. Uh, I think it's a very, very good thing that the LEC actually changed uh, the format by making it only one Super Week, because I think Super Weeks are insanely draining. I think they're a bad competitive thing. It's not because you're playing a single BO1. It, the, the, the fact is you are playing like when you play one match, the amount of preparation that goes into that match and the time sink that goes into that match is ridiculous. You need to adjust your whole schedule. Uh, like to play one BO1, legit, you have like four to five hours of the day already locked to play one BO1. Because you need to do food prep, you need to drive before, you need to wait, you need to meet up. Like the, the amount of effort you need to put in. I would, I, it would be much cooler if it was like fucking three BO1s in one day. It would be less tiring, honestly. It would be less tiring than than anything else, you know? Like if they did, like the old uh, group system, the old group system at Worlds when they played six BO1s in one day from the same group. Like you just put four teams in one box, something like this. But uh, that, that's the problem, about having 10 teams, right? I have to say like LCS changing the format. It's like having eight teams makes you so flexible. Because they just have two days, two show days, all eight teams are playing. Best of three, best of three, best of three, best of three. I think that shit is super, super cool. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very jealous because I think that um, even though it's sad, right, that people would lose jobs and so forth, I, I do think that there is some fat to trim uh, for the benefit of the league, you know. Um, but uh, it is what it is. Uh, let's talk about the teams and the players. Fnatic! Fnatic, Fnatic, Fnatic. We had a very, very big match between Fnatic and, of course, SK Gaming. Uh, SK Gaming, I think that um, they had a draft that was kind of uh, uh, uncommon for them, I would say. I think Fnatic has really, really found their identity in terms of, um, you know, their, um, their draft. I think that it's super, super clear cut uh, for Fnatic, what they like to play and so forth. We just look at this. Like this, this looks like such a fanatic draft, right? It's like you have the Varus, which is something that we saw uh, less of. Uh, we see the Hui answer. Hui, humanoid in caps, really, really pop off uh, when it comes to this champion. Hui into Tristana, they like a lot. And then the Zinzao Kesante. Zinzao got nerfed, right? Because Sundered Sky is a weaker item. But the Kesante for Oscarinin is a classic. This looks like a very cohesive fanatic draft. I do think that SK had many pivotal moments where they could have won the game. I think that um, yeah, we can talk about that more when we talk about Fnatic. I think Fnatic looks better than they did at MSI or the previous split. They look sharper. I think that they remind me of a little bit more of the reform that we saw in uh, the spring playoffs when they were beating out the teams. Um, I think that they have been better at playing around mid angles. I think that they have been better in their fight selection. It, it seems like Fnatic has found the element that has improved. I think something that stood out to me before this particular match was just uh, how they drafted around their AD. Uh, we had Koki uh, here, and then we had uh, another Aphelios here. I think that uh, Noah looks a lot more comfortable on the crit AD carry. So I was surprised to actually see uh, the Varos come through here. I think it was more of a denial and securing the matchup rather than anything else. But Fnatic, I do think that Noah, when he's playing the crit ADs, he does look uh, a little bit better. So uh, I think he, I, I, I just wanted to highlight that. Accordingly with Oscar Riddin as well, you know, he has the rumble in the back pocket, which I think is a crucial pick in the current meta. Scan is getting perma banned and also they have Ivan in the back pocket. I think that Fnatic has done a, a big part in shaping what the EU, uh, EU meta is, right? In terms of uh, some of the key champions that they do like to play. I'd like to see, you know, some of the AD mids from Humanoid. I know that he liked to play them in the past. We'd love to see that evolution, you know, maybe like uh, Tristana come through for uh, Mr. Marek Brasdalini. I think that would be interesting. Uh, so uh, we'll have to pay attention to that development. But currently, I think that um, Fnatic uh, looks pretty damn solid. But the game against SK, I think the game against SK was a bigger highlight of SK's problems rather than Fnatic's strengths. I think that the, the other games were a bigger indicator. Uh, the, double, the, the indicator of Fnatic strengths were a lot more obvious in the other matches that we saw in my mind. Uh, so I think the perfect team to move on to then is SK Gaming. SK Gaming, the other side, the loser in that big pivotal matchup against Fnatic, 
Uh, I think the key thing for me uh, when it comes to SK, I think that they are very, very good laners. I think that Niski has a good, is very good at connecting. I think that the, the main issues I see from SK were similar to last week. I think that whenever Isma is doing spontaneous plays, whether it's like a 2v2, like a 2v1 trap on side, they're trying to find a gank, or maybe they do an invade on a blue. I think this is where SK is disconnected, which uh, kind of makes sense considering uh, like kind of the language barrier. But Isma doesn't seem to tether well to his teammates, which gives away opportunities. I, I think that they can be sharper on pulling the trigger around Nasher. I think irrelevant as well in terms of his farm distribution as the game carries over and carries on, I think could be a lot better. I, I don't like seeing these Renekton picks. I feel like these Renektons, they always go 0-3 in the game and never find any value. I think Renekton's peak moments in the game are moments that no one can really leverage. I think that the Renekton was very strong in the past because his six coincided uh, like his fight on the Herald, which was a very crucial objective at minute eight. Uh, I think Renekton was very strong in, but Renekton just doesn't seem to get any traction. I think like without without the go drinker, without these big items with Sterax getting nerfed again, I do think that Renekton is, is a champion that I don't like seeing as much. I think that if you look at SK's identity, I do think that if, if when Irrelevance is playing the champions at scale uh, and Niski is playing the equivalent of a Renekton mid, I do think that's like a better identity. I, I do think, uh, similar to how Nucleant is, I do think it's important to be able to play these champions that need to farm a lot of side and scale and lane well, like Tristana. Uh, there were some moments where I think Niski could have clutched out the game, especially in that final fight against Fnatic. So this is like the element that I think that they still need to work on, you know, in terms of playing the really, really hyper carry mid laners. Uh, but I do think that um, Irrelevant and SK need to kind of clean up their mid to late game in terms of their farm distribution, in terms of their fight selection, because their early game is quite strong and mechanically this team is uh, has a lot of depth, honestly, a lot of depth. I think Rahel is fantastic. Luon is, is playing super well. Like even this game, Rahel on Ezreal was looking uh, very, very Korean. Like Rahel was a fantastic signing. And if someone told me, whoa, Rahel is the best performing AD right now in the first five games that we saw, I think, uh, you know, um, I, 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 can, I can see that argument. I can definitely see that argument. Rahel has been fantastic. I think Rahel, the clear MVP for me there, uh, for Fnatic, I think it's just... Um, I feel like Fnatic, you know, it's just Razork. Uh, like, I think Humanoid and, and, and June are probably the players that stand out the most, but I do like Noah too on the Crit ADs, so it's it's a better look for them. Uh, let's carry on. Uh, G2. Uh, G2 uh, took uh, two wins on the weekend. I think that no one was worried about G2. I think that they started on the patch late and they had uh, losing scrims for the first time in a long time. Uh, there's definitely, you know, some lag there, but it's not like G2 is not going to make playoffs. I think that G2 with time in the routines, I think that uh, all will be fine and dandy. I think uh, the key thing for me is when it comes to a lot of these games, I feel like um, the gameplay from uh, the gameplay is just quite sloppy, you know, very sloppy. Uh, it, it feels like it kind of lives and dies by how well Caps is going to be playing on the day. And um, I think that G2 should have a way higher standard for themselves, you know. Um, I think that um, we, we, we shouldn't be worried, though. We shouldn't be worried. These best of ones, top eight qualify. I, I think that, uh, you know, it's fine. G2's coaching staff is, is a shit, you know. But I think that um, G2, you need to use every fucking game to, to prove a point, you know, for yourself to build uh, because if you want to do damage at the World Championship and uh, you're not going to be boot camping and you're going to be only screaming in Europe and not screaming against any of the Asian teams in preparation for the Worlds that is in Europe, uh, you need to uh, make use of all of these fucking stage games and actually uh, play at your peak uh, to, to make a very, very accurate assessment of where you're at and what you need to improve on. So that volume, even though they will make it through, even though they will probably win the split regardless, um, is a question of the long term and the long term will be benefited by taking every fucking game that you have as heavily and as crucially as possible. All right, let's move on to Giant X. Giant X, um, I have to say, 
All right, finally get the first win. I think that Jackie's has been performing really good, putting out good damage numbers. I feel like he's playing uh, with uh, a certain certain amount of bravado. He's playing, you know, to win, uh, which might sound silly, but there are some players that are afraid to lose, and that can be way stronger than your will to to win. I think that Jackie is a player that uh, you know I think was a good pickup, good signing. I uh, I think that he. Uh, is definitely one of those players that uh, over time will grow to become uh, even better. I'm happy with Jackie's. I think Tony as well, bro. Tony. Tony has become a stream favorite for us, Tony. I think that the big issue in week one for Tony was that he really, really, really liked to engage on midwaves. And he has toned down that uh, he has toned that shit down a lot. Like Tony was solo killing caps on the Tristana with the Rumble. I feel like Tony, you know, like, look at Tony. Look how base Tony is, guys. Like, I, I, like, like, look at Tony here in the in the GX game that they won. Look how many bands my man's tanking. Skarner, Rumble. Bro, Malka is not for jungle. It's for Tony. No, I'm kidding, of course. Uh, and then Orn, Malphi, bro. Like, they are ban banning him out. And then he drops the poppy. And he had a pretty fucking good poppy performance, man. He had a really, really good po poppy performance. So God bless him, you know, like... Like, the Antonio has been really good. I, I think that he, he is performing uh, better than Otto Amner. Like, this was this was a gangster move. Like, he, he is really proving himself, in my opinion. Like, obviously, he isn't the best top lane in the league right away, but I think that uh, it, it's working. It's working. Top lane in EU always comes down to playing tanks, and uh, he does it well. He does it well, man. Shout out to fucking D'Antonio. So, to me, I think that this team can become better and better depending on how much Ignar, Juhan, and of course Patrick also contribute. And I thought that in terms of the overall impact for this team, I did think that Ignar and Patrick would be the focal point, Ignar and Juhan also sharing nationality. But then week one, Juhan was mostly like the type of guy that he was very similar to Peach and being similar to Peach is not a compliment. Uh, but I think in week two, it looked a lot better. I think the GX looked fine against G2. Uh, if we look at future matchups that are going to be crucial for GX, I do think the GX look better than, for example, uh, KC, who has one win above them. I could see a GX also beating a Team Heretics as well. I think the GX uh, could definitely work their way up here. Uh, I think the GX against Team Heretics and Kamin Corp, I think that's uh, pretty fucking solid, you know? Pretty fucking solid. So, I think the G GX is, 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 is a team to look out for, you know? I think that uh, Tony and Jackie's my MVPs on this team. Jackie's probably, if I have to pick one, uh, Tony is uh, finding himself. He's really, really finding himself. I already faced Team Heretics, they are facing Vit. Yes, but you, 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 that was not my point. Uh, I'm just making a comparison in terms of where they would place in the rankings, you know, in terms of teams. All right. KC. KC, KC, KC. KC had a terrible weekend. Terrible weekend. I think that KC is suffering from draft delusion, which is common. Like, I, at some point, I feel like these coaches need to step in, right, and say, yo, what the fuck are we doing? Why are we playing these champs that never, ever fucking win? Um, investing scrim time, investing play time. Nidalee is the most cursed champion that people just keep locking in, thinking they are canyon just because they went 10 0 in scrims and it worked. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I think it stems from the fact that junglers that play solo queue want to climb, so they play Nidalee. But it's like jungling in solo queue is so different from what it is in competitive play, so I kind of hate it. So. The first one, we had the KC, right? KC against Team Heretics, the Caitlyn. I think Caitlyn is basically the Nidalee of AD Carry. Uh, especially when you're playing so imprecise. Caitlyn needs to be able to push every wave, needs to be able to stand on every wave, needs to be able to walk first to every objective. If you are limping in because enemy Varus has mid prior and you have to limp to a fight or sack a wave, Caitlyn is useless. The moment you lose a wave, the moment you lose pressure with this champ, you are not getting it back. You need to secure front to back positions with traps and you need to be first to every scenario otherwise your champion is going to be useless this type of drafting i do not like especially after kc's wins in week one 
I think here Rogue was pretty terrible and weak in my mind. I think that they had the way better draft. And then, of course, the game against Mad Lions was just an utter steal. Uh, I think that you cannot be drafting like this uh, with the level of imprecision that KC is playing with. But I do repeat, I do think that KC with the roster, I do think that they can play a lot better than they are. Uh, like, it does seem like Nerves is really getting to this team. Uh, they don't seem relaxed at all. And I can understand because the past, the ghosts of the past are really, really breathing down their neck, you know. It's really breathing down the neck and that's just rough, you know. That's very, very rough. A lot of pressure with the amount of fandom that is in KC. A lot of pressure with the past that is happening, of course, when it comes to uh, the spring split and the winter split. And additionally, you know, like these players, everyone besides probably Vladi, I think these players are really fighting for their career. Uh, I think that's true for any player that's playing, but like if this team doesn't make top eight, like I think that uh, there's going to be a lot of players here that played in a major region for their final time. And uh, that's also something that must weigh super, super heavy. And you don't want to be in a position where you're at the mercy of other teams running it down, uh, which uh, uh, segues us perfectly to Mad Lions. Mad Lions, um, they were always the team that struggled in the mid to late game to execute. I think something that they did well in winter was in terms of how they accelerated games, they were very good at cutting through into sides and punishing uh, solo laners that were straddling and they were just, uh, you know, walking behind these waves, uh, trying to steal them. And they were very good at punishing that and that's how they transferred. I thought that the uh, cooperation between Alvaro and Elioia was something that made them a very strong early game team. But now it seems in the process of trying to reinvent themselves, it seems like they have even lost that part of their sting. We can still see Alvaro and Elioia playing together, but it seems like they're trying to solve a lot of their issues uh, through draft. Uh, here they are playing a composition that practically plays itself right as the game continues in the Ivan Jinx, Kisante, Azi, Brom. But this is just kind of a band-aid solution to a problem that has been there the whole year. Uh, this is you praying that your composition will take you across the finish line because you are under heavy pressure uh, to take wins. So Mad Lions on the rope, uh, that one strength that they have uh, is slowly, slowly being trimmed down. Uh, like if we think back at the best moments of Mad Lions is that like I want to see more Viego action. I want to see a more fighting jungler that clears fast. I don't know what has happened to Elioia's spirit, but he's playing just champions that don't like mechanically low uh, I think that we want to see some Ivan, we want to see, like, like, sorry, we want to see some Viego, we want to see some fighting action. Um, we want to see some fighting action. Like, if you're playing the support jungle game, pick a fucking jungle support duo that can actually contest and lean into your strengths rather than straying away from them. Um, I think that um, they've lost themselves in the process of finding themselves. You know? Like, uh, it's always like that, Rob. When, when you are peaking, you need to kind of deconstruct what you're doing and then find a new peak, you know, because a lot of the things that you're doing that are successful might be hindering something that is more successful. You get it. And um, right now, Mad Lions are deconstructing the early game and taking a couple of steps back. And it seems like Mad Lions have lost all of their confidence. Not so sure. Rogue. Rogue, you know... They tried some stuff, you know. Uh, every time we see uh, Larsen play, he has a different Corky build. He had Mana Mune this game, which is kind of wild. Mana Mune, Trinity Force. Um, they had some moments in this game, but I think that that was just G2, you know, with their full AD draft that G2 has been drafting back-to-back -back games, right? Uh, they had the full AD here with the Lucian, Zinza, Corky, and now the full AD as well here with Tristana, Ash, Kisante, right? Um, Sure, in some games it doesn't matter, other games it does matter, but uh, let's focus on Rogue. Like Rogue, you know, imagine Rogue had the audacity to pick Nidalee. Um, like, um, they had the audacity to pick Nidalee and the other had audacity to pick Caitlyn. Uh, they are trying to, you know, reenact some of the moments that a player like Comp and a player like Marcoon might have in solo queue, but the imprecisions of these teams and the lack of proactivity and the lack of really any sense for any advantage scores, 
I think that uh, this is very, very far off. Uh, I want to add as well, uh, when it comes to Rogue, like if you want to make it more tangible, their biggest issue is that I think that all of these players are too afraid to actually take any form of space. They, they don't have any faith in their own abilities. And it's like, let, let me let me draw this paint. I right, pull up paint. Let me show you guys. So let's say this is the mid wave, right? This is the mid wave. Uh, let's say you're, you're a champion, right? And your sphere of influence is like this, okay? Then enemy champion here. Enemy champion. Let's say it's a Nautilus, right? And he has a sphere of influence like this. How rogue play is that... So let's say this is a Caitlyn, right? No faith in the E ability, no faith in movement, no faith in nothing, doesn't posture forward, doesn't play. This Caitlyn... If this is the Nautilus, right, this dot here, and this is the sphere of influence, this Caitlyn is now here instead. Like, he's playing from fucking flash distances of, of gameplay. And I think this extends to everyone in Rogue. I think it extends to Larson. I think it extends to Jungle and Support when they're trying to take space. It's like, Viego, Lee Sin, these type of champions, they are very good because, like, they are very good at gaining information. But they are never posturing forward and seeking information. It's like, oh, we don't see anything in River, so I will never go in River. But they are not seeking information they are not posturing they're not leveraging their champ they're not playing on skill they're not challenging anything uh, so they're just sitting on the turret hoping uh, that they will never be in range to die and um that is the main issue of rogue you know like this this team just needs a complete reboot because i feel like it's been the problem of rogue for the longest time i think that malrang was the one person that gave this team teeth and you might say that malrang was fucking inting a lot by the end of it but I think that if you play with the players on this team, I think that you slowly go insane because no one's fucking pulling the trigger ever. No one's ever pulling the trigger. And I'm quite disappointed in Finn because I had higher expectations of him. Uh, so SK Gamer, we talked about Team BDS. Team BDS, man, same thing as before. I do think that Ice and Labrov are really, really good. Ice and Labrov. I, I like what I'm seeing from Ice and Labrov. Uh, they made a little elegant solution in regards to Rumble. Uh, let's pull up the Rumble game for BDS. Uh, they put it in the jungle. Uh, and this particular game, I think that SK... You know, I, I think the main thing that's weird about for me for BDS in terms of the draft prep is just their obsession with Rel. I, I know that uh, Lavrov is a good Rel, but I think that they really, really invite good, strong counters. This game, I think BDS should have won it. It was a big Nash throw where SK got a comeback in the game. So I don't hold them like, oh, BDS is bad now because of this loss. Um, I um, think that um, BDS, you know, is a solid team. I think it's a solid team. I, I, I like that they are exploring in the world of top lane to enable, you know, like let Adam play unique champions because it's got champs. They've gotten him far enough, but it can't be the only thing he plays, you know. He's playing the Gragas, he's play, they're flexing the Rumble. You know, I think it's good exploration on BDS's uh, part. The main thing I want to see more of is just the, uh, the evolution of, of Nuclear in terms of how he you know, uh, plays uh, hyper carries mid. It's the main champion that stands out is Tristana. But I think that um, in the game BDS played against um, AC, I think it was very clear that uh, BDS is much better macro wise. And uh, they were farming sides, they were pushing sides deep, and KC with their composition uh, didn't accomplish anything. The KC is also has suffered from the same issue as Rogue in some ways, that they are very scared to tether and uh, they are being walked over because they are giving up a lot of space. Um, in this particular game, uh, like the Twisted Fate blind with the Yasuo invitation. Like, I don't care too much about Yasuo in a lot of cases, but Yasuo against Nautilus, Maokai, you know, Maokai all disappears into the wind wall. Tristana, it's like Yasuo just, Yasuo wind wall. He doesn't need to press any button besides wind wall and his champion value is insane. Super, super insane. I want to show this one moment, guys, uh, from uh, the game between KC and BDS that was really mind-blowing. Really, really mind-blowing. Look at this. Look at this moment here. I think this was 
the craziest moment in the whole game. Uh, let me see if I can find it. I think it was the Nash situation. No, it was like Nuclear Int died on side. And then there was a natural opportunity. Second Nash. Let me find this. Trying to find Nuclear Int died. They killed Nuclear Int on both. Not here. Here it is. This moment. So, Nuclear Int, 20 seconds till respawn. Nash is alive. KC has an opportunity to clinch this game. They have fantastic Nash damage. They have good tools. The composition has scaled to the point where they are strong. As we are walking into this situation, KC, they begin to hit. But look what this Yasuo does to them. I think it's strictly illegal. Look at how far Adam is allowed to walk. No one's hitting him. No one's doing anything to him. What is that, man? Like everyone, like look at this Yasuo, how he's walking in. He just, he's leveraging his wind wall. You know, he wants to, but no one's triggering his wind wall. No one's forcing him to do anything. No one's doing anything. And Targamas is positioning in this spot, has, has no hex flash. Like this, it's crazy to me that this, look, look how far out it is. They knew, they know he just spawns. They know he just spawned. How can you be in the state of mind where you don't want to take this fight, man? You're getting zoned by a wind wall. Like, this is atrocious. And Casey's two wins, I don't think that they are real wins. But I do think that Casey, they, they, they are capable of doing better than they are. Like, their players are better than what they are showing. Like, this, this they just look so damn stiff. Like, this is crazy what this Yasu is allowed to do here. Like, let's just play it again because... Like when I was watching this live, my mind exploded. My mind literally exploded. It looks like he's 8th item Kesante walking in. Prime, 56% win ratio, solo queue, uh, hotfix buffed. You know, like, it's crazy how they just let him enter and everyone's respecting a wind wall because no one wants to fucking create space for one another. So it's like BDS, practically get Nasher, 4v5. Uh, it's it, 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 it's it's crazy. I was like BDS in terms of how they convert, right? Because even this game, they were in a good position. It got really, really sloppy. I think the main thing they need to work on still is just... I, I did notice that they did some side laning, but there was also moments where they're getting caught and killed. Uh, in terms of how they progress in the mid to late game, I do think that that's where they need the most work. You know, that's where they need the most work. All right. Team Retics. Team Retics, I think, very similar uh, to what we said the last time. I think that um, Wunder and Yankos are now playing <laughs> less mechanical intense champions, and they look good. I do think that Team Retics is a very smart team, but a very mechanically uninteresting team. Very, very mechanically uninteresting. And um, I, I, I don't know what to do there. Honestly, I don't know what to do there. They need some spice, you know? Like, the spice would have been... At the beginning of the season, perks, support, boom. Put Jack Spectre in there, push him to, 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 to become better and smarter and more bold in his approach in the fighting. And then, like, they could have had Jackies, you know? Like, a little Jackies. Uh, Jack Spectre here, together with the veterans, would have been a good mix. But this is just, you know, this is just uh, the retirement home here. You know, this is just a retirement home. I, I think the team that is laning is quite weak. Uh, the, and I think that's also an expression of mechanical skill, you know. I think in anything in terms of like map movement and so forth, I think they're good. But we, we, they need some, they need some oomph, you know. They need some bravado. They need some, they need some flair. They need, they need Jezuke. They need leader, you know. They need a player that is going to actually use all of this, you know, space that these players are capable of creating, like. I always say, like, all roads lead to Rome. Who is your Rome? Like, who is the Rome on this team? Right? The team, team, like, a team like Vitality, you know, if Kazi has gold or Fulton has gold, you know it's going to be impactful. So it's like you feel good about giving to him. But here, you have a bunch of good road builders. These, they, they are all building roads. Yankos is a road builder. Wunder is a road builder. Trimby builds roads. Zvairu seems to be a road builder. And Flak at the same thing. 
who is the person that you feel good about putting gold on you know who 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 do you rely on like what is the identity in terms of you know the progression of the games because all of these homies build roads and i think this is just like bad jamming if anything you know because i do think wounded is still good i think yanko is still good i think trimby is still good you know they just need some some fucking fire you know they need some fire and uh I think that the Zvira and Flacket are too uninteresting in the positions that they play, you know? Too uninteresting. Team Vitality. Team Vitality. 2-0 weekend after 0-3. Uh, they stepped it up. Um, I think that Vitality still, you know, I think the key, key details here is just how the jungle and support work together. I think it looked a lot better this week. They were more in tune, they were more on the same page, which I think matters a lot. I really like the Ezreal, the Ezreal from Vitality. This is 14-11 still, pre-buffs. Kazi is um, showing that he's a really, really strong player. I like seeing it, really, really good. Um, the, the, they had pretty easy matchups, I would say, in Mad Lions and also uh, Team Heretics. So I don't want to get too over eager, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's a solid look. Uh, we keep seeing these full AD compositions like this with the Tristana Sejuani rotation. Uh, that's something that G2 did too, uh, which I don't like super much. Uh, I kind of, eh, I don't like it too too, too much. So if we, if we if we round off now by just calling out, you know, uh, you know how we expect the standings to do, and we do a little power ranking in terms of current form, current form, right? Current form. Um, Let's see, LAC, tier list maker 2024. Let's pull it up. Create your tier list 2024. Um, so this is where we put pre, uh, pre splits. It's where we put the little vitality gambit here and the uh, under evaluation of SK for sure, for sure. And um, here in this moment, I think uh, G2, like G2 is a wild card, right? They are very weird. Uh, like uh, the. Um, the, the G2 situation is very strange, right, with G2. Um, I think that Fnatic SK, I think I would put them on a similar tier. I think that's the best of one that could have gone either way. Um, I think the Fnatic is a little bit better macro-wise, I would say. And I think that they have a good identity of the draft. But I think that SK have a little bit things to figure out. So I think they are limping right behind. Uh, BDS I would put here because of their uh, mid-game uh, problems. This is where it gets interesting. I think Vitality is slotting in right behind. And this might sound strange, but I honestly think that GX is the team that might have uh, the most potential out of the bottom five, uh, based on what they've shown. Uh, uh, maybe it's, it's, it's a crazy thing to say, but maybe Team Heretics is like... The team Heretics, they will always play to their ceiling, I feel like, but their ceiling is quite low. So I could definitely see a world still where they are better. We are not going to see the GX Team Heretics matchup, but I think it's someone like this. And um, Casey, Mad, and then Rogue finally. It's like Mad Lions really need to find themselves again. And um, I, I think it, I, would, I would place it somewhat like this in terms of where we are at. I, I, I think there could be an argument for putting Team Heretics above GX. Uh, but I kind of like what I see from, from Jackies and the Antonio, and I think that they are playing cohesive and better together. And they have solved the issue of the first uh, first week. You know, the first week they were just engaging on midwave, and I feel like they're a lot more dynamic in how they play. So shout out to GX, you know. I think uh, GX is up there. You know, G2, it's weird to place them here, right? It's very weird to place them here. Like, uh, it's, it's like I would want to fucking remove them, you know, from the fucking list, you know, because it's goofy. It's like we're sitting here and saying, yeah, Jesus is going to fucking bounce back. But in terms of what we've seen so far, like if we look at the gameplay we've seen so far, G2 would be more like here, you know, like Jesus should be more here. Uh, like I think that Fnatic and SK in the games that have been played have shown a better level than G2. But it doesn't mean that tomorrow I'm going to predict uh, fucking G2 to uh, lose to them, you know. So there's that. All right. Uh, that rounds off the rundown.